Okay, welcome to chapter 7 of my CEH version 9 material. This is called System Hacking. So this is where our labs are getting a lot more funner. Because now that we've learned about things like footprinting and reconnaissance and system enumeration, now we can start figuring out well, how can we gain access? What can we do on our from a target to a victim type machine? So that's what this chapter entails. So, first of all, we have to do a few basic things like, how do we gain access to that system? Well, we can gain access several different ways. We can gain access through an exploit. We can gain ac uh, access through an uh, opening up in that system. We can uh, gain access through uh, breaking a password or guessing a password or getting their password. Uh, you'll be surprised, sadly, how easy it is to get people's passwords. More often than not, it's a simple ask them. That's about it. So what's the big deal? So you gain access. What happens? Well, that does open the system up to whatever that user can do. That also opens it up for you to be able to do like some type of escalation of privileges, trying to get additional privileges for your user, assuming it's a standard user. That sets up the process for further action or further incursions into that system. So there's a lot there. So let's talk about cracking passwords or breaking passwords. Cracking a password literally is trying to break someone's password. Passwords are again the most widely used form of oral authentication because it's something that you know. It's normally fairly easy. It's something that a lot of people don't normally change. Uh, more often than not it's easily guessed. So, passwords are a commonly targeted item, so are usernames. But I mean, usernames you can always get through social engineering or other things like that. Because again, passwords are what most organizations try to protect. You can also do enumeration to get usernames, and then social engineering to get passwords. So, are there different ways to break passwords? Yes, there are. Uh, there's guessing, there's brute force. Brute force even has several different ways. Uh, you can start trying different combinations. You could try uh, doing it off of a word list or a dictionary. So there are lots of different ways to crack passwords. So it's important to realize that when we say password cracking, it's a group of techniques. It's several techniques. It's not just one way. So what makes passwords susceptible to cracking? Well, normally we, if it's a good policy, it's three of four type of characters. Uppercase, lowercase, special characters, and numbers. Well, you can actually have just so many combinations of those, so depending on your password characteristics, that can make your password more susceptible. For example, if you're only allowing numbers, well, if you have eight digits, then it starts with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it drives that combination. If uh, we throw in maybe just symbols, again, there's only so many symbols. So if we start combining them with numbers and symbols, or lowercase and numbers, we start increasing the possibilities, but again, Organizations aren't going to force their staff to have 20 character password. Normally, a typical password is about 8 characters. And if they're using uppercase and lowercase, and that's it, again, that limits the combination that are there. If we do uppercase, lowercase, and a number, there's still several more possibilities, but again, we're no longer talking about hundreds of years to crack. There's lots of different ways. So, are there different ways to crack passwords? What are the main types of password cracking? So we have passive, which that's going to be more like sniffing. We have active, that's going to be either brute force, guessing. Brute force, again, will probably be with, with a word list or a, a dictionary list, but there'll be something there. Offline, called a rainbow table. That's where we can start taking hashes and comparing hashes. 
or we have the non-electrical, social engineering. So these are the major ways to start breaking people's passwords. Again, this is not the complete list. This is just common ones. And it's a good thing to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each one. So what does it mean by passive online? Basically, you're going to be using you're going to be using passive techniques. So some of those techniques could be uh, you sit back and you wait type attitude, you uh, sn uh, sniff packets, you uh, exploit weak password protection schemes. You look at older protocols. Again, you don't really do a whole lot. You're more of a sit back, relax, let passwords come to you, normally in the form of packet sniffing. Wireshark comes in great here. But again, it kind of depends on the individual. So one of the fun things here is also the older protocol versions. Because again, uh, as holes are found, we upgrade, we adapt. Uh, IP headers, for example. An IP header from 2002 is completely different from an IP header in 2016. Okay, maybe not completely different, but there's clearly some differences. So let's look at differences between protocol vulnerabilities to sniffing. Hmm, this is always real fun. Plain text items such as Telnet, uh, FTP, anything that will transmit passwords in plain text, HTTP, FTP, POP, uh, TFTP, things like that, those are vulnerable because the passwords are sent in clear texts. Pop and IMAP are horrible with this. Telnet. But there are ways to actually protect Telnet. Instead of using that, use a secure shell. Yes, more setup is required, but things like passwords are not sent in clear text. So there are benefits. Here we have a packet tracer. Sorry, not packet tracer. Wireshark. I was doing Cisco Labs earlier, so packet tracer is on my mind. Uh, there's other types of packet analysis tools out there, like Network Miner, Network Monitor, or DSNF. Uh, Wireshark is a very common one, so Wireshark is most often uh, used. Because again, with things like Wireshark, you can actually capture packets. So it's always nice. Uh, man in the middle attacks. So, a man in the middle attack is where a device is able to break a session between a client and a server and funnel traffic through it. Uh, Pineapple are a great example of this. You uh, connect to a wireless device which you think is the server but in reality is really this Pineapple device which is funneling traffic through it and you don't know. So that's always a fun one. A lot of protocols are very vulnerable to man in the middle, so it's always kind of fun to talk about that. Active online, this is going to be more things like guessing, brute force, uh, malware, that's always a good one. Malware that will install like a keylogger, for example, that's always a, a good example. Uh, malware stealing passwords is becoming more and more common. Uh, active, not so much online, but just active. Could be things like grabbing uh, flash drives that are like a rubber ducky that auto load a keylogger. So malware is gaining a presence. So password guessing. And it's really sad, but bad passwords are out there in the very common things like phone numbers or names of best friends or pets or spouse or dates of birth. God, you'll be surprised how many businesses I've worked with where their administrator password was their phone number just because that was easy to guess and that's where social engineering comes into play because again you could start doing password guessing based off of things that they tell you like hey wh what's your phone number again very common for phone numbers to be a password using malware which we kind of already talked about but we're going to keep going a little further into this in 2005, Gio Lopez, a businessman from Florida, filed suit against Bank of America after unknown unknown hackers stole 90,000 from his Bank of America account. Hmm. The money was transferred out. The investigation showed that it was uh, Lopez's computer that was infected, and so there. 
So malware is a class of software with no <laughs> beneficial use. Uh, that's subjective. It's kind of depending. Uh, no legitimate beneficial use, I guess, would be a little bit more okay. But well, malware is more commonplace now than ever before. Uh, different types of malware also exist. So we have to be aware of that. We actually have the next chapter dedicated to malware. So we're going to go more into malware as our next chapter. Malware could just be an example of a keylogger. That's one type of malware. Alright, so let's talk about offline features. So a rainbow table. Rainbow tables use pre-computed hashes to identify a password. Basically when your password is hashed, let's say it's password. A hash is used. If you actually have the hash for password, and I compare your hash with the known hash password, then I can go, oh, well your password is password because the hashes are identical. Because again, normally we don't get to see your password. We only get to see a hashed version of your password. So we're actually able to look up certain common passwords. Not all passwords are there, but common ones are. So an example of a rainbow table is something like this. Because again, we're looking at the rainbow table comparing hashes. It does reduce difficulty in brute uh, force methods. It does generate hashes for every possible password. Again, that it knows. It's faster than other types of attacks. And it's very common and very effective against LAN manager machines. LAN manager is something we haven't really talked about, but we will get into. Let's talk about privilege, privilege escalation. So that's always a big one. So when you gain access to a system, normally you gain access as a user. So how do you increase access? How do you get your user account to have additional access? You typically do this through uh, breached accounts that, uh, again, don't have the appropriate privileges. So you find a way to raise the privileges. They can be vertical or horizontal. So what does that mean? Vertical raises the privileges of an account that has already been compromised. Horizontal compromises one account and then another and another, each with an increased level of access. So there are different levels of escalation. Tools for privilege escalation, uh, Kali Linux. How is that a tool for privilege escalation? So there are tools built into Kali that allow you uh, Windows uh, PE type environments or recovery environments. Okay, those aren't really tools. Those are just different operating systems and operating environments. But there are several different ways. Opening a shell is always a good one because, again, you can do a lot through a shell. So what about running applications? So when you have a shell, you actually can execute commands through that shell. And that could be things like backdoors or keyloggers or malware or other different uh, software. So one of the last parts is once you've actually gained uh, escalated privileges, you have to find a way to cover your tracks. Because again, the important step is removing the evidence that you were there. Uh, that could be things like eliminating logs or altering logs. So again, you need to understand how to work with log files. So your goal is to prevent leaving any information or any trace that you were there. So things like disabling audit features or things like that. They may not always prevent people from knowing you're there, but they're going to be slowing them down at least. Another big one is actually alternate, uh, alternate the data streams. So ADS was introduced in uh, Windows and TFS, an earlier version of the TFS, as well as other Mac systems. So you can actually manipulate audit files from machines. I know that's not what this is really talking about, but we're talking more like logs. But since we're talking about covering tracks, I thought that was a good point to bring up now. You also have ways to alter the stream uh, from data. You can actually use specific software 
to detect or to manipulate these data streams so that you can kind of save them a little bit longer. That is the end of this chapter. Again, this was just a quick brief overview. I'm going to be posting some labs here a little bit later, so definitely take a look at those.